So we talked about, we were just finishing with letter D, and uh, we had, there's a quote there at the end right before letter E. What we are is God's gift to us, and what we, are, we make of our lives is our gift to God. And what we're talking about is the gifts of the Spirit. When you got saved, God gave you the gift of the Holy Spirit. He is a gift of God, and he gave you the Holy Spirit to dwell within you. Uh, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have? Uh, you have the Holy Spirit if you're saved. And uh, if you have not the Spirit of God, you're none of his, the Bible says. And so he is our gift. But along with the Holy Spirit, he gave us what the Bible calls a gift or gifts of the Spirit. And that's what we're trying to look at here and talking about the gifts and understanding what they are. What we want to try to do is understand, first of all, what are the gifts? There is not one list in the Bible of the gifts. There are, there are different lists in different places and some that are even listed individually. So you have to kind of compile them together to get all the gifts. And so we want to understand what the gifts are. We understand what they do. What is the gift of mercy? What is the gift of ministry or whatever else it is? And then we want to know what is my my gift. And then fourthly, want to know how to use my gift. How do I use the gift that I have? And that's what we're trying to look at. Now, letter E there is um, what are the categories of the gifts? So we're going to go right into page nine. So if you don't have a page nine, raise your hand. Anybody does not have page nine and 10 is what you should have as well from last week. We did pass those out last week. And so if you're here, you should have it. Get yourself a binder to keep your notes in so you don't make us keep copying and copying and copying for you. We appreciate that. Uh, but pages nine and 10. But what are the categories of the gifts? And so we want to kind of divide those up. Uh, go into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, one of the primary sections dealing with the gifts of the Spirit, both uh, what they are and how they're misused sometimes. Uh, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 4 through 6, the Bible says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but the same God, which worketh all and in all. So the Bible teaches that are, there are diversities of gifts. In other words, there's more than one gift. And um, the Bible doesn't directly do this, but we kind of divided the gifts up into three categories. And the first one is um, just gifts in general. The word gifts means, uh, I'm sorry, the, this is from the Bible here. The Bible tells us that there, there are three different things we need to understand about the gifts. Verse four, it says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. The word gifts, again, comes from the word charisma. So put in the blank there, the word gifts. And it comes from the word charisma. And uh, the word charisma means a gift. Uh, we talk about the charisma of grace, the gift of grace. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God gave us the gift charisma of grace. And so basically it just means a gift. Uh, we, we are familiar with the word because of the charismatic movement. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, but that's what the word gifts means. So there are different gifts. There's a gift of mercy. There's a gift of giving. There's a gift of teaching. There's a gift of serving. So there are many different gifts, diversities of gifts. And then there are administrations, verse number five. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And what that means is a ministry or office of service. That's the place where you use your gift. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Hold your place in 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to come back there. But 1 Timothy chapter 3 and look at verse number 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of bishop, the say, he desires the good work. So he wants to be a pastor. So a pastor, it, it, he uses his gifts in, the, in being in serving as a pastor is where he's the, the office where he uses his gifts. Now there is a gift of pastor to the churches and we've talked about that. We will some more, but, uh, but administration means this is where I use my gift. Look at verse number 13. For they that have used the office of a deacon well. So some people use their gifts as a deacon in the church. Uh, you might use your gift as a Sunday school teacher or as a nursery worker or as a hospitality or usher or whatever else it might be. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 7. 1 Corinthians 1, 7. So that, that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we, we have our gifts, but we use those gifts in an area of service as well. 
and your area of service may not match your gift in a way that you would normally think that. I talked about last week, a teacher doesn't have to have the gift of teaching. They may have the gift of mercy and loving their children. They may have the gift of administration and being very organized. And so it's, it's the place I use my gift. So wherever you go, you want to know this is what my gift is. And in this church, where am I going to use that gift in serving the Lord? And then we have operations, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse number 6. And there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all and in all. The word operations comes from the word, root word where we get our word energy from. So it's the energy to work in an area. And what this is, is you can have five people that all have the same gift, but they have different levels of energy. In other words, you could have five different people with a gift of teaching, but one of them is a better teacher than the other four, and one of them is not the best of the five. And you have different levels of that. So there's different energy levels. You might have five people with a gift of giving, and one is, is their gift, they're able to give $1,000, where another person, they've got the gift of giving, but they're only able to give $100. Uh, they have a different level of that ability that God is, that gift that God has given them. And by the way, it's not a bad thing. Remember the parable of the talents? He gave one ten talents and one five talent, one one talent, the problem wasn't how much they had were given. The problem is what they did with what they were given. And so we have different energy levels. We have different abilities. And some people just seem to be able to accomplish more with their gifts than others can. It's kind of like when you buy a refrigerator or something like that. It has that energy tag on it. And it's the efficiency to do more work with less effort. They've just got a little bit better efficiency in their gift and a better ability to use that. And so we see this in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 7, Ephesians 4, 7. <clears throat> but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So there's a measure. There's a different measure. Some people get a little bit more than others do. Uh, there's a measure of that. And then also Romans chapter 12 and verse number 6. Having then gifts different according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, how much you're given. To whom much is given, much is expected. And again, the Lord doesn't judge us by the amount of the gift he gave us, because that's what he gave us. He judges us by what we do with what he has given with us, that we're able to return unto him both the 10 and the five talents, they doubled it. Uh, they really worked hard to increase what they were given there. And um, the, one, the one with one wasn't judged because he only had one, it's because he did nothing with it. And so operations is energy. So as you look at your gift, what is my gift? What's the level God has given me? And I want to develop and use that to the best of my ability to stir up the gift, uh, to, um, to neglect not the gift. And then what is the office where I'm to use that gift? And it may vary. Now, gifts seem to be divided into three groups. This is what I was trying to talk about before. Um, we see the gifts listed, some of them listed in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. And by groups, I'm not talking about passages. These are some of the places where they're listed. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we have a number of gifts, gifts listed there. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and 1 Peter 4, 9. <clears throat> these are the four primary passages. There's some other ones we'll look at. We're going to look at these quite a bit, so I'm not going to turn to them now. But these are the places where you find lists of the gifts, the gifts listed for us. And they're divided into three categories. The first one is what we call, and again, these are our divisions. The Bible didn't say there's one group this, one group that, but we kind of have to help us to comprehend it and to understand it. We, as theologians, we've kind of divided into three groups because we see three groupings. And the first one is the sign or manifestation gifts, the sign or manifestation gifts. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number seven. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. In other words, what we're supposed to be doing is we're supposed to be taking that gift and people look at us and say, wow, look at what he can do. That must be of God. Now that doesn't just mean for the sign gifts, but for every gift. People ought to be able to look at you as you use your gift and say, wow, look what God is using him to do. Not look what he's doing. Look what God is using him to do. Okay? So the manifestation of the gift... Of the, of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. 
For to one person is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge to, by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit. And then um, you can look over in, um, uh, let's, look, let's list some of these signed gifts. First of all, there's words of wisdom, words of wisdom. And then there's word of knowledge. And these are a little bit different. Uh, and we'll talk about these more later on. Uh, but uh, if somebody's given the gift of the word of wisdom, they're able to give you wisdom from God. Another one is given a gift of knowledge. They're able to give you knowledge from God. Uh, faith is another gift here, the gift of faith. Uh, the gift of healing. Working of miracles. Prophecy. Discerning of spirits. Tongues. And interpretation of tongues. Now, these were all the sign or manifestation of gifts. In other words, God gave these gifts to prove that what he was doing was of God. The primary reason these gifts were given was to say, here's a sign. Here's proving what's happening right now is of God. Then the second group of gifts are called ministry or motivational gifts. Ministry or motivational gifts. Go over to Romans chapter 12. We're all very familiar with verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So God says, now that you've given your life to me, use your gifts. Look at verse number 3. For I say through the grace given unto me, every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, because it's a gift from God, it's not from you, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man, the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, or he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, that, and he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So here we're given a list of gifts, and these are subdivided into two categories. We have the speaking gifts, which are prophecy, teaching, exhortation and ruling. I'll go over those again. Prophecy, teaching, exhortation, and ruling. Now, if you don't get all these down, I leave my notes up here afterwards. Just come up here and copy what you missed there, okay? But prophecy, teaching, exhortation, ruling. Now, these are not necessarily what you think they are. Uh, prophecy, for example. There is a prophet in the Old Testament who foretold the future but in this case, I think prophecy is more of the, the person that preaches. Brother uh, Tozier would have the gift of prophecy. Uh, teaching is different. Uh, prophecy is telling you pretty much what you already know, but convicting you. They, they speak in such a way it brings about conviction. Where teaching, the person with the gift of teaching, you, you learn, you understand more from them. And... Um, and then you have the gift of exhortation and ruling. And the ruling is divided up into two gifts we'll talk about. Then there's the service gifts, the service gifts. And that's administration, organizing things well, administration, giving, mercy, and ministry. Those four. Administration, giving, mercy, and ministry. I'll say it one more time. Administration giving, mercy, and ministry. Then the last group of gifts are what we call the office gifts, or they're primarily gifts to the church. They're not so much gifts to us as individuals as they are as God saying, I am giving you this person as a gift to the church. Go over to Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 8 through 12. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 8 through 12. Ephesians 4, verse 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it, what is it but that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? We talked about that in Christology. 
He that descended is the same also that ascended up up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So these were the gifts he gave to the church. He gave apostles, which are no longer for today. We'll talk about that. Apostles are no longer, uh, they were a specific group of men, and that's over and done. Uh, He gave prophets. Now, in the Bible times, he gave prophets that gave revelation from God. Today, he gives the preacher. He gave evangelists. Now, we call Brother Tozier an evangelist, but that's not what he's talking about here. An evangelist is a soul winner, somebody that's really got that gift of of bringing souls to Christ, either individually or in public preaching as well. And then he gave pastors and teachers. So we have apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. All right. So page, the next section, I don't, I, I'm not sure how yours are moved. Mine are a little bit different, but the sign gifts. What we're going to talk about first is the sign gifts. And, and just as a general overview here, we don't practice the sign gifts as they were practiced in the Bible days. We don't believe therefore today like they were in the Bible days. Uh, the, the group that you see this most practiced among is charismatics, um, and you'll see them doing it. And the sign gifts have a very specific purpose, and I believe a very specific time. Now, I do believe that the, 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 the gifts are still for today, but they're different. For example, in the Bible times, the gift of healing was a gift given to someone, like the like story of Paul and John, when they, uh, Peter and John, when they healed that man, remember Brother Tozier preached about by the temple that was uh, crippled from birth, and he stood up and walked, that God had given them the ability to heal. He'd given the gift of healing for them to reach out and take his hand and pull him up and heal him. Now, I don't believe that gift is for today, and I'll show you why, but I do believe that there are some that God is still giving them the gift of healing, it's just through prayer. There are certain people that if I'm sick, I want that person praying for me because they just seem to have that connection with God. If you're sick, you want them praying for you more than anybody else because they just have that ability to pray for people and see them healed. They don't lay hands on you. They don't smack you in the head or anything else like that. They just have that ability to pray for. So it's manifested differently now than it was in the Bible. And I'll show you why. So let's look at the notes and stay with me here because it's important to understand this because most of you at some point in your Christian life already, and if not, you will be confronted by somebody that says to you, do you have this gift and whether the gift of speaking in tongues or, the, or some of this, one of these sign gifts, and they emphasize that. And why would that not be for you and I today? Okay, so first of all, what were the sign gifts for? What was their purpose? What was their reason? First of all, they were power for the disciples in perilous times. Now, we, we all know Matthew chapter 28, uh, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And if you look there at that passage, we, we kind of don't finish it all up. Uh, but if you look at verse number, uh, number 20, uh, it, 18 through 20, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto him, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things which I command you. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So all power. He's given them the power to do it. Now go over to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, the same, I think the same incident in the life of Christ and disciples, just a little bit different narrative to it from from Mark's perspective. In Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 18, he said unto them, go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved, but he believes not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up servants. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, so he's saying here, I'm going to give you all power. That's in Matthew 28 to go. And you're going to do amazing things. You're, you're going to, uh, you're going to cast out devils. You're going to speak in new tongues. You're going to uh, take up serpents, which we saw Paul did. You're going to drink poison uh, and, and it's not going to harm you. Why did he give them this ability to do that? Because they were going out 
taking a brand new message to a world, they were going to face persecution and things. They needed that. They didn't have the complete word of God. Jesus had left. Now they need something to prove that this was of the Lord. Now, most of the times today when people talk about the sign gifts, what's the main gift that they think you need to have? Speaking in tongues. That's the main one. I, I, I had a pastor friend of mine, and he was sitting down at a table with a guy who was trying to convince him how you need to speak in tongues. You need to speak in tongues. And he took him to Mark chapter 16. says, God says you'll speak in, 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 in tongues. And, and uh, the wording here is, uh, uh, they shall speak with new tongues. And he says, see? And so my friend just got up from the table, didn't say a word, got up from the table, went over to the sink, went onto the sink, opened the doors up there, got some Clorox bleach out, poured it into a cup, came back and set it down in front of this guy and said, have a drink. The guy said, no way. I'm not drinking that. He says, you don't believe the Bible then. Because look at the next verse. He says, it says you're going to drink any deadly thing and this will not hurt them. See, if you're going to take one, you've got to take them all. Uh, you know, down south, they've got some churches, not so much today, but they've had for many years, and there's still some around. They're called snake handling churches. Have you ever heard of those, you know? And in the service, they actually handle snakes because of this verse. Now, that's not what God was telling them to do. And, and I'm not going to do that. I'll tell you that for sure. I, I'm not going to be handling snakes. I, I've done that. I've had a snake in my hand one time, and that's plenty enough, you know? And uh, uh, you know, the, the, if you're going to take one, at least they're honest. At least they take all of it. Now, I don't know if they drink poison too, but this was a very specific promise to a very specific group of people for a very specific time because you need some power and you need some proof. See, the, the power for disciples in perilous times and number B, given to prove the new dispensation was of God. Now, those who have been around for a while, you know what the word dispensation means. It's a time period where God deals with saved men differently. There was a dispensation of law where they brought sacrifice to the temple and they couldn't eat certain things and couldn't touch certain things. We don't do that today. Why? Because we're in a different dispensation. And so Jesus brought in a whole brand new dispensation. You tell them to the Jews, you don't have to go to the temple anymore. You don't have to bring sacrifices. You can eat unclean things. And, and all of them are saying, well, how do we know that's of God? And so they need to prove that was of God. And how are you going to prove that? And these gifts were given to prove that this was God doing something amazing, something different. It, it would be like me getting up in church tonight and saying, God's given me a new revelation. And now he's told me that animals can get saved. So I, I want you folks to know that when we go out soul winning on Saturday, you need to stop and talk to the dogs and the cats about the Lord too. You need to give them the gospel. Now, you guys would be looking at me about like you're looking at me right now, saying, Pastor, you need to be checked in somewhere. Uh, we need to find a new church. You wouldn't believe it. But if I were to bring a dog up here, set it up in a podium and tell these folks how you got saved, that dog starts, yeah, yeah, he led me to the Lord on Saturday and I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. If that dog started talking to you, you need to be looking at me like I was a ventriloquist. You might be thinking, maybe he's true. Maybe that's right. See, it would take a miracle like that to prove it was of God. And, and for the gospel was just as dramatic of a change. And so they needed to show that this was of God. And they needed things like healing when they healed that man. And he jumped up and started leaping around. They needed to have these things that where they could stand up and start speaking in languages that they've never learned. They needed that miracle of God to prove this was of the Lord. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. Ye men of Israel... Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by what? Miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourself also know. So Jesus proved himself by the miracles that he did. Then look at Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were with all, all with one accord in Solomon's porch, and of the rest, there's no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. 
I mean, it was just amazing what God was doing. Then go over to Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression of disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. I want you to know something here. First of all, he says, how was the gospel confirmed? By the signs that they did. But notice how it says that it was confirmed us, unto us by them that heard them, God also bearing them witness. See, it's no longer necessary today, and we'll show you why. It was necessary for them, but it's no longer necessary today to prove that this is of God. So it was given for power. They were in a very perilous time dealing with persecution and, and the possibility of death. It was given also for proving this was of the Lord. Number B, why aren't the sign gifts for today? Okay, there's three basic reasons we don't believe they're for today. Number one is because they were given for a transitional period. We saw this in Acts chapter 16. They were given for a transitional period. Those of you in the military, doesn't the military love to make changes about every three to four years? It just seems like they get one set of rules in and all of a sudden they say, now we got to do it differently. Like they got all these new uniforms coming out. And, and so it's amazed me too, but by the way, the army's new uniform is the old uniform. You know, they're going back to what they were. But they, what do they do in the transition? During the transition period, you can do a little bit of the old and a little bit of the new. During the transmission, there's certain transition period, there's certain things that they allow and they do that we're not going to do once the transition is complete. You have to remember that Acts is a transitional book. Much of the books that we read in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, they're all part of the transitional period and not everything that was done there is gonna be done today. So there's certain things like the gifts that were given to, to transition from the Old to the New Testament that are no longer in use today. They were just for the transitional period. And then number B, is because the word of God is now complete. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at verses 8 through 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verses 8 through 10. Charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to come true. It means they're going to stop. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. All right, a couple things you need to see here. First of all, when it talks about, in verse number eight, that prophecies fail, tongues shall cease, and knowledge shall vanish away. For both prophecy and knowledge, the Greek word used means they come to a stop. It just, they're gonna come to a point where this is it, we're done. With tongues, the idea of that word, it will gradually fade away. It's going to gradually end. It wasn't an abrupt stop. So the, the prophecies and the knowledge stopped at a certain point. Tongues just kind of died out. Now, why is that important? Look at verse number nine. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come. Now, what does it talk about? What, what, is, what is that which is perfect? Most people say it's Jesus, but it's not because Jesus is not a that. He's a he. It was talking about Jesus. It was saying when he which is perfect has come. See, a lot of people read this verse and say, well, when Jesus comes again, we don't need these things anymore. But that's not what we're talking about. He said, when that which is perfect has come, the word perfect can also be translated as complete. We know in pro part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is complete is come, then what does it say there? It says, then that which is in part shall be done away. I don't need a prophet to get up. You don't need me to get up on Sunday and say, God gave me a dream last night. Let me tell you what he wants you to know. You don't need that anymore. Why? Because you've got the complete word of God. We don't need prophets. 
We don't need people with a gift of knowledge to be able to tell you this is what God wants you to know because we've got all the knowledge we need right here. So it's complete. So it's not talking about Jesus coming again. It's talking about when that which is complete is come. When we have the full word of God. So once the word of God was complete, these gifts are no longer necessary. I don't have to prove it. I don't have to bring a dog in here and say, look, it, this, is, this is God. He, he didn't tell you how you got saved. I don't have to prove what the Bible's already proven. It's, the Bible's enough. It's a sure word of prophecy. I've got everything I need right here to prove that this is of God. Then number C, because both Christ and the disciples stopped using them in the latter parts of the ministry. You study the Gospels. You'll see Jesus did a bunch of miracles early on in his ministry, and then he stopped. Didn't even do any more miracles. He just started preaching. And when he started preaching, people stopped following him because they wanted the show. They didn't want the word of God. He did a couple miracles right before he died, but most of his miracles were done in the early part of his life, and then they stopped. Same thing with disciples. You read the book of Acts, a lot of miracles in the early part of the book of Acts, none in the latter part. You look at the, the books of the Bible, the New Testament, uh, mo the ones that talk about the sign gifts are the early books. The ones that were written later don't talk about the sign gifts because they were no longer used. They used them to begin with to prove this God, but there came a point that says, you know what? We don't have to prove ourselves anymore. You ever, you ever try and deal with somebody and you say to them something like this, how many times do I have to prove myself? I prove to you that what I'm saying is true. I don't need to keep doing it over and over again. And the proof was there now in the testimony of souls being saved, lives being changed, of, of the word of God being completed. Don't need this anymore. And so we believe it's, it's over, it's ended, it's no longer necessary. But there are groups of people today who do practice a, a form of the gifts of the spirit, uh, the, the, the signed gifts, mostly the speaking in tongues, some churches do healing services. Some say they do miracles, you know, where they can, uh, they, 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 they call on God and a miracle happens or things like that. Uh, a lot of them are clearly charlatans. I've been proven that way. A lot of those TV ministries, uh, you know, they, it's, they had journalists go in there and they recorded them with microphones and people finding out beforehand what was going on and fakery and all this kind of stuff. There was clearly some fakery, but there were some clearly things that, hey, wow, that looks real. What is this? Is this really of God? And it's, it's mostly part of what we call the charismatic movement, but not exclusively that. So what are some of the problems of the modern charismatic movement? Why are we not charismatic? What's the problems with it? Well, one is the modern charismatic movement began in the early 1900s. You trace back the modern movement of charismatic churches. It began in the early 1900s. Before that, you don't see it. It just wasn't there. It's, it's a new phenomenon. So you have the Bible gifts and then all of a sudden, this is all stopped for hundreds and hundreds of years, and then it starts up again in the 1900s. So it's more of a modern movement. It's not, we always want to look at things that have continued from the Gospels till today. You know, when something stops, there's a reason why. Now, sometimes because men stop doing the right thing, and sometimes because issues come up, but it's, it's more of a modern movement. The charismatic movement is strongly ecumenical. E-C-U-M-E-N-I-C-A-L. We are not ecumenical. Now, what is ecumenical? The ecumenical movement says, as long as we believe in the same thing, we can come together, which sounds good. But you see this practice in ways, well, you know, Catholics believe in God, Buddhists believe in God, Muslims believe in God, we believe in God. So why don't we all just get together on what we believe in common? That's ecumenical. And, and, and they'll move down. Some people say, well, only if we believe in Jesus. Well, the Mormons believe in Jesus, but they don't believe the gospel that I believe. So we, the ecumenic movement wants us to come together on what we would call the lowest common denominator. In other words, the lowest thing we all believe in, and let's work together based on that. And we, there are certain basic beliefs that we're not going to compromise and you see this very strongly within the charismatic movement. It's with an emphasis on proselytizing rather than evangelizing. In other words, within the charismatic movement, what you see oftentimes, instead of going out to win souls to Christ, to win the unsaved, their emphasis is more, let's get Christians to become 
charismatic. And that's something I want to be careful of. You know, we praise God. Most of our church, not most of it, but a good percentage of our church are not Baptists in background. And, 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 and we, we teach the word of God. By Baptist, we mean we're Bible-believing, teaching the word of God. And I praise God for that. And, and they've come in here. We're not, we're not going out trying to pull people from other churches, but there are people come here saying, I want Bible teaching. And that's great. But you know what our main focus is? Let's get people saved. That's the main focus. I, I remember when I was a young uh, guy, I joined the Air Force, and I went to basic training. I wasn't real grounded in the word at that time by any means. And I got to my school, and a couple of guys came to me and says, hey, you, you, you ought to come to this retreat with us. And they brought me to this retreat, and the whole retreat, the whole weekend was about getting me to speak in tongues. And, and, you know, that was their whole focus, was getting me as a Christian to speak in tongues rather than reaching unsaved people for the Lord. And we want to make sure we're, we're, we got our emphasis right. Okay, number C, and let me make this as clear as I can. Even a Christian can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. I have got some good friends that are in the charismatic movement. They, they would consider themselves charismatic. And they're godly people who love God who are saved. There's no question in my mind on that. But that doesn't mean you're right. Peter, in Matthew here, Peter was a godly man who loved God. Jesus said, who do people say that I am? Peter says, well, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter said, man, God, Jesus said, Peter, you got it. Man, you got it right. I'm gonna build my church on that statement. He's patting Peter on the back saying, you got it, man, you're, you're right there. Two verses later, what's he say to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, what did Jesus say? He said, I'm gonna have to die. Peter grabbed Jesus and said, no, Lord, you can't die. Was he sincere? Did he love Jesus? He was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong. So be careful of this. Sometimes we look at, and there's some charismatics that can be more sincere than some fundamental Bible-believing Christians I know. And, and, and sincerity is not the test of truth. And that's what we have to be careful of. I want to go back to the Bible and see what the Bible says. And I want to practice according to the Bible's way, not according to what feels good. And the problem is a lot of the charismatic movement, a lot of modern Christianity is more about how I feel than about worshiping God. Let me tell you something. Make you a good guy. If what I'm doing in worshiping God could be done at a rock concert with the same passion, then that by itself is not worship. People at rock concerts look more passionate than a lot of Christians do when they sing. They're over there swaying and holding the light up and just really having a great time. But that doesn't make you worshiping God. Now, does it mean it's wrong to put your arms up? No, the Bible talks about lifting holy hands and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with praising God. There's nothing wrong with these things. But be careful, the emotion doesn't overcome the Spirit. What we describe as the Holy Spirit more often than not is our emotions and not the Holy Spirit. Now, should our emotion be evolved? Here's the thing we can learn from charismatics. Let's get emotional. We're so afraid we, we won't get emotional. I appreciate folks in church that will raise their hands. You'll see the choir do it sometime when they're singing and just raise their hand. They're not trying to draw attention to themselves. It's not about emotion. They're just so, so overwhelmed with God. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with a good loud amen and praise the Lord. There's nothing wrong with getting emotional. I'm not criticizing that. But remember, you can get just as emotional at a rock concert or a football game as you can in church. And if that's your basis, then that's not worship. Worship is about God. And when I worship God, it is going to affect my emotions. And I'm going to be wanting to physically manifest that in some way or another. But it's not about feelings. And that's letter D there is is the emphasis is on feelings and phenomena rather than the scripture. Uh, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse number 20. You go into a lot of churches that practice the sign gifts. It's all about how you feel at the moment. It's all about, wow, look at that. Look, at, He's smacking somebody in the head and they're falling down and they're getting healed and all these things are going on. It's all about the, the show. And Jesus rejected that. When they came looking for the show, feed us again. He said, no, I'm going to preach to you. 
It's all about the feelings and phenomena. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, they speak not according to his word is because there's no light in them. So when they start telling me these things, I want to say, show me the Bible. Show me the Bible. And I want to look at the Bible in context, like Mark chapter 16. If you're going to say speak in tongues, then drink the poison too. Pick up the snake. Be consistent with the word of God. Let's look at what the Bible says. And so there's more focus on feelings and phenomena. I've literally said this to people. I've literally opened my Bible up and shown us from the Bible, and this is what they've said to me. I don't care what the Bible says. I know what I feel. Ooh, that scares me. That scares me. Because it's not about how I feel. It's about what the Bible says. You can feel the right things and not be doing the right thing. You can feel perfectly fine and be dying of cancer. Or you can feel terrible and sick and there's nothing wrong with you. So be careful of feelings. Nothing wrong. God gave us our feelings. He gave us the emotions. And if God does not affect your emotions, there's something wrong with you. And you ought to want to shout. You ought to want to praise the Lord. You ought to want to physically manifest yourself towards God. But it's not about the show. It's not about look at me. It's not about distracting from, you go into some churches and all the big things going on, they all distract from folks on the Lord. It's about the word of God. It's about Jesus. And then numbers E there, there's a wrong emphasis on the Holy Spirit within the Trinity. We talked about this earlier, John chapter 16. He will speak, not speak of himself, but he's going to speak of Jesus. You see, the Holy Spirit always is going to focus on Jesus. And so you go into any church or you open any book and it's all about the spirit this and the spirit that and praying to the spirit and this with the spirit and that with the spirit. That's a red flag. Now, should we not talk about the Holy Spirit? We should. He's part of the Trinity. He lives within you. He's, he affects you on a daily basis and you ought, to, you ought to be familiar with him. And don't be afraid to talk about him. And, and again, we in our, our churches, we were so afraid of the charismatic, we don't talk about the Holy Spirit. But his focus is not on himself. It's on Jesus. And Jesus focuses on God the Father. So we have to get that right. So we want to look at these things and understand them. So we want to understand what is the gift of tongues. What is practiced today is not what the Bible talks about. And we're going to look at that just briefly here and introduce it. And then we're going to go into it next week. And we're looking at the same thing with healing and all the rest of these. And again, do I believe in these gifts? I do. Do I believe they're for today? Yes. But manifested differently. Healing is not, let me lay hands on you and heal you. It's, let me pray for you and heal you. Miracles. There are people I know that just have a way of just calling on God and a miracle happens. God's just given the ability to have the faith to believe in miracles. Remember years ago when we were at the other building down here by Cycle City and uh, Wendy's, you know, that third building with the roofs that go like this and it's got the big old Hana with the motorcycle inside. That used to be our church building. We left there in 2010. And... Before we moved in there, that building was part of a big group that owned a bunch of old restaurants here in the islands. All the old restaurants that are now closed, they own them. And uh, they were closing them down where Cycle City, there was a restaurant there. I forget the name of it. Do you remember what it was called? I can't think of it. Anybody remember that? Kelly's, Kelly's restaurant. And uh, they were there. Uh, we went in there after they closed down and started because we were going to take some stuff to use. And and after I saw their kitchen, I thought, I ate here. <laughs> you know? uh, it's one of those old sticky foot places, you know. And they had a bunch of restaurants like this. And that, the building we were in was used for their offices and all their storage. Well, it was empty for a couple of years. And, and they got some homeless in there and caused some fires and stuff. And, and this whole corner was empty for quite a few years. And we were looking for a building. We were meeting a school time looking for a building. And and um, I went over to ask about the, the building, and they said, yeah, it's for sale. Or it's, it's, it's a leasehold land, but we'll sell the property to you, but you, won't, you have to pay the lease. And we'll sell it to you for $300,000, and then you have to pay $33,000 a month. And I said, well, it's nice talking to you. And I left, and we went looking for other building. We looked and looked and looked and couldn't find anything. And one day, there was this Korean lady in the church at the time. Her name was Suki. Suki had a wonderful testimony. She had grown up in Korea during the Korean War, never got to go to school because she was a child during that time. There was no school during the war. Moved here to America, 
never learned how to read Korean or English, married a guy that was a drunkard, miserable life. She got to the point, she said, I'm done. She decided to commit suicide. And as she was getting ready to commit suicide, she saw this thing about a church and she called the pastor up and, and the pastor led her to the Lord over the phone and she got saved. And the pastor gave her his Bible, his King James Bible, Suki can't read. But she loved that Bible because it told her about Jesus. And she would just sit there and hug that Bible. And she said, God, I want to read that Bible. I want to read my Bible. And so she would open the Bible up and she would look at it. And, and she just, she never took a class. She never did anything learning. She would just look at it and she just said, God, I want to read my Bible. And God gave her the ability to read. This is miraculous, your testimony. Now, she had to put some work in there and some effort, but she started reading her Bible. Now, she'll tell you, I could read my Bible, but I couldn't read a newspaper. I couldn't read any of the books, but I could read my Bible. Her husband was a drunkard. He would come home to shower and go back out again to drink, drink and gamble. He was home showering one day, and he heard Suki. The way she would read, she would read out loud. And so she was reading. Now, again, she's reading the King James Bible. You tell me, Pastor, I can't understand the King James Bible. You talk to Suki. Her husband, after she, well, I'll tell you that story later, but her husband heard her reading out loud. She says, Suki, what are you doing? She said, I'm reading my Bible. He says, you can't read. She says, I can read my Bible. He said, no, you can't. He thought she had memorized verses and was acting like she could read them. So he said, read me a verse. And she read a verse. He says, okay. And he turned the page. He says, read me that verse. And she read the verse. He turned the page. Read me that verse. And she read the verse. And he couldn't believe it. He ended up getting saved too. After he got saved, he decided that Suki needed an easier Bible to read. So he said, we're going to go buy you a new Bible. She says, no, I want my Bible. She had the Bible the pastor had given her. And he says, no, we're going to go buy you a new Bible. He insisted. So she, she just said, Lord, I don't want a new Bible. So they went to the car, got in the car. car wouldn't start. And then they, got, they finally got started. And then they figured out they had a flat tire. And then on the way there, something else happened. Finally, he said, you can keep your Bible. He went back home. But, you know, this lady came to me and she said, Pastor, I've been praying for you to find a church building. And this was the lady I want praying for me. There's certain people, there's certainly, I'll be honest with you, some of you say, I'll pray for you. It's like, okay, great, thanks. And then there's certain other ones, you say, I'll pray for you. Praise God, you're the one I want praying for me. She was one you want praying for. She had a gift. And she said, Pastor, I'll pray for you about it. I said, Suki, pray about this. So she prayed about it. She came back to me about a week later. She said, Pastor, what about this property over in the corner? She pointed, she was telling me about the property over here. And I told her, I said, I've already talked to them and they want $300,000. They want $33,000 a month. I said, we can't do that. And she, her eyes got real big. You know, the Korean eyes got real big. And she said, oh, well, let me pray about it. I said, okay. So she went home, prayed about it. A week later, she came back to me and said, Pastor, I believe God wants us to have that property. I said, okay. What do, I, what do you want me to do? She says, I want you to go back and talk to him. I said, okay. I, I don't argue with prayer warriors. So I went back and talked to this guy. Set an point, went, went to him and said, I don't know I talked to you before, but we'd really like to have a building. Could we get one of the buildings? He said, I'll give you the building over there, the one we end up in. He said, I'll give that to you for $10,000 a month, but I'll give you two years of free rent and you can have that building. Now we had to do some work and stuff like that, but we got the building and God did a miracle. And that is the gift of miracles. Suki had that gift. Nobody else could have done that except for her because God gave her that gift to have the faith that I couldn't have I would have never gone back and talked to them. No, no way to happen. But God used a prayer warrior with the gift to have faith to see God do something. She didn't go out there and say, Lord, call down the fire of heaven on these people until they lower the price. She didn't do anything like that. She just got down on her knees and prayed and waited for the Lord to speak to her and just followed the Lord's leading. You know what? That's a lot better miracle than the Lord called down fire from heaven because the glory goes to God, not to the Suki. And that's what I believe the sign gifts are for today. You know, if, if the gift of tongues were today, I took Aaron 
out to lunch today, the Chinese family, this refugees from China, they fled because he was number four on the arrest list. Praise God that God's provided for them amazingly. They're getting refugee status, starting down that process. They're moving to the mainland. Took them out to lunch today. Took Nathan Ching, who's a missionary to Chinese people here in Hawaii, and, and uh, with me to talk to him. And they're sitting there going back and forth in Chinese. And I'm saying, Lord, what, it'd be nice to understand what they're saying. But I couldn't understand a word of it. It would have been nice if I had the gift of tongues or the gift of interpretation, but that's not for today. If it were, why does God make the missionaries take so long to learn language? Nathan will tell you he had to work hard to learn Chinese, and he's still learning. Now, God has given him a gift to learn it, because I don't have that gift to learn that language, but it's not in the same sense it is in the Bible. And that's what we need to understand. So we're going to finish up looking at these signed gifts. And we'll go fairly quickly. We're going to look at them, try to understand them a little bit. Then we're going to look at how they apply for today. And then from there, we'll get into the gifts, the other gifts as well. So stick with me. But it's important because every one of you, if you have not been, is going to be confronted with the question, especially, have you spoken in tongues? That's just, you know, at some point in your Christian life, you're going to be confronted with that. And you've got to know what you believe and why. And then why do we not have these other gifts? Why don't we have healing services or things like that? And why is that not for today? So we need to understand that in order to understand the gifts as a whole. And that's what we're going to try to go with. All right. So I hope it's been helpful to you. And if you've got questions here, this is one of the areas I don't want to offend anybody. And again, I'm not here to, to, to put down the charismatics. They put us to shame in so many ways in so many areas. We can learn so much from them. But Bible is Bible and truth is truth. And I want to learn from them, but I want to do it the right thing in the right way.